So we're going to talk about cardiac output. Um, think back to a dog. That was my dog just there, Clancy. How big do you think Clancy is? 45 pounds. 45 pounds. <laughs> well, amazing that you should know that. So what is that in kilograms? How would I figure that out? Divided by 2.2. So do that. There might be some math problems on the exam. 45 divided by 2.2. 20 20.5, which is up from his 18 something that he used to be. Okay, 20.5. Now, if he's 20.5 kilograms, how much blood do you think he has? How would I figure that out? Okay. How many milliliters of blood do we usually have per kilogram of lean body weight? 75. So multiply that 20.5 times 75 mils. And if you just want to get rid of the 20.5, round up, round down, I don't count. Where, what do you come up with? 1,537. 1,537. So how many liters is that? 1.5 liters. Okay. A human would have around five to six liters. Clancy probably has 1.5 liters. And that assumes that all his weight is lean body weight. Um, he used to be a lot leaner. He's not this lean anymore. But he probably has at least a liter or so of blood. Now we're going to talk about cardiac output. How long does it take him to circulate this blood through his whole cardiovascular loop? Okay. And so cardiac output is the amount of blood that that animal is moving through the circulatory system in one minute. And it changes versus if the animal's resting or the animal is exercising. And so the cardiac output is the product of stroke volume and heart rate. So stroke volume multiplied by heart rate gives you an estimate of cardiac output. Now, heart rate we've already talked about. And we said, what's an average heart rate for a larger dog? 60 to 80, somewhere in there for the sort of like 50 pound Labrador retriever range, you know, could be a little bit lower, a little bit higher. Um, and then the stroke volume varies as well. Stroke volume is just how much blood the ventricle is pushing with each beat. We're talking here about the left ventricle. And it's hard to measure this. There's a, a reference I think I've got in the PowerPoint for somebody that actually did measure it back in the 60s. Uh, they got a bunch of mongrel dogs, they called them, and, and uh, did some kind of tracer that we were able to get an estimate of stroke volume. And it can vary between two mils for your little bitty breeds all the way up to 30 mils for your larger breeds. Uh, for humans, it's about 70 mils. Um, so let's stick with 30 mils. What does 30 mils look like? Okay, think about a, what a shot of alcohol is. You know, like one shot, I think, is 1.5 ounces. Is any bartenders in here? Yeah. That should be around 45, 50 mils. So we're talking about a very small quantity of fluid. So think about if that animal has um, a heart rate of, let's say, 60 and a stroke volume of 30, what is the cardiac output? Oh, that was quick. Who was that? Oh, excellent. So you went to the Alabama School of Math and Science, did you not? <laughs> OK. So. Cardiac output, 30 times 60, 1,800 milliliters per minute. Okay. Again, this dog, assuming it's my dog, how much blood did he have to begin with? 1.5 uh, liters. liters. So in less than a minute, he can circulate his entire blood volume. Again, this assumes that a certain weight and that a stroke volume is this high. This is kind of high stroke volume for dogs. But this is what a nice athletic dog can do just lying there. It circulates its whole blood volume in a minute or less. And that's what people do as well. Now, when this dog begins to exercise, what's going to happen to its heart rate? It's going to go up. And his cardiac output's going to go up as well, right? Because cardiac output's just stroke volume times heart rate. So as long as the stroke volume stays the same, we expect the output to go up. So let's imagine the same dog. He's no longer bored sitting there. And now he is running like this. So he's running flat out, and his heart rate is now 240. So what would his cardiac output come back to be? So how do I fi figure that out? 240 times 30. What does that come out to be? 7,200 milliliters. Okay. 
7.2 liters. So earlier he was pumping, what, 1.8 liters. Now he's pumping 7.2 liters. What does 7.2 liters look like? A lot. OK, what's two liters? A soda. A soda bottle. That's why I used to actually get into class, and we talk about the human heart like after exercise. And I would have 15 soda bottles, and I'd fill them up with red water to give the point that this dog can pump well, that's, let's see, one, two, three, four. That's three and a half soda bottles. Does that sound about right? That's a lot of blood that dog's pumping. And they can even pump more. Um, there's a point at which if the heart beats too quickly, it can't fill in between. And then the stroke volume actually goes down. But for dogs, they seem to be able to sustain a fairly high stroke volume up through fairly high heart rates. And so we call this ability of the heart and the cardiovascular system to pump so much more blood during exercise the cardiac reserve. Okay, so cardiac reserve is your ability to pump more blood during times of stress. And for humans, we can do it by a factor of four or five, and, and well-conditioned dogs can even go beyond this. Um, but then you think about your geriatric animals. Like, think about those pets that you have that you walk them to the mailbox and they get winded, right? Okay, they've got a lower cardiac reserve, okay? They get more tired just because their cardiovascular system isn't able to compensate as much for that increased exercise. So younger animals, conditioned animals, tend to have a fairly high cardiac reserve, whereas animals that, you know, are older or just, you know, lie around the house all the time are gonna have a lower cardiac reserve. Okay, so, who controls the heart? We said last time that the heart is weird and that it's a muscle that's autorhythmic. What did that mean? It controls its own beating. And so what area of the heart controls its beat? What area sets the pace? Who's the pacemaker? The SA node, the sinoatrial node, okay? And the sinoatrial node tells the heart how many times a minute to beat. Now, the heart can beat without input for the brain uh, at least for a short time, but the brain can definitely modify it. So the brain can increase the heart rate or it can say, hey, slow down, decrease the heart rate. Uh, and this is based on sometimes things that are automatic, that are sort of unconscious, all brain stem, but sometimes some conscious input can raise the heart rate too. Can you think of anything that can cause your dog's heart rate to go up? No exercise, but just some kind of visual stimulation. Mailman, right, the UPS guy. The UPS, you know, we're in a second story apartment and so my dog can look down and he hears that truck, you know, the sound that a step van makes, it rattles up and he's just like, oh my, God, you did not. And he's at the window just, he's so indignant that this guy's here to deliver a package. And so I imagine his heart rate is just So that's all based on cortical input from the cortex, the, you know, the conscious area of the brain Something stimulates that dog. If it sees another dog it doesn't like, that can raise its heart rate. If it becomes... Reach for the leash. What? Sees you, you reach for the leash. Yeah, that's going to elevate the heart rate. So there's some things that visually can stimulate the brain, which will send nerve impulses uh, to the heart and increase the heart rate in anticipation of killing the UPS guy. <laughs> okay. Um, there's also... Cardiac accelerator nerves, so the sympathetic nerve and cardiac dampening nerves, a parasympathetic nerve. These are two divisions of what we call the autonomic nervous system. Okay. Has anybody heard of autonomic nervous system before? Okay. So what is that? So parasympathetic is when it slows you down. Mm -hmm. Sympathetic is when it speeds, speeds you up. So when I say autonomic, think automatic. This is the automatic nervous system. You're not conscious or aware of it, but it sets things like heart rate, respiration rate, uh, and it also helps in, indirectly to control some hormone levels. So we have the sympathetic division and parasympathetic division. Like she said, sympathetic division amps you up, increases heart rate, dilates pupils. Parasympathetic uh, lowers the heart rate. It constricts the pupils. So when you're relaxed, you have more parasympathetic responses, and when you're stressed out or excited, you've got sympathetic responses. So things that occur under parasympathetic are what we call SLUD responses, and we'll talk about this later, but S stands for salivation, 
L stands for lacrimation. What's that? Tears. Tears. U, what do you think that stands for? Urination. Urination. D is defecation. And the other one is digestion. So these are things that are sped up when you're more relaxed, you have more parasympathetic nerve impulses. Okay, you salivate more. You lacrimate more. Your eyes are moist. You urinate. Your pupils are constricted. Okay. Um, on the other hand, think about the last time you were almost in a car wreck. Mm. Or like, as a, you know, a really bad car wreck. You're like, oh, this is it. You know, brakes squealing, stuff like that. How did you feel afterwards? Excited. Excited, okay. Shaking, right? You're shaking like this. You're amped up on adrenaline, on epinephrine. And so we call those those fight or flight responses. Fight or flight. And so there we've got an elevated heart rate, elevated respiration rate. Okay, what does your mouth feel like? Dry, dry right? It's just your mouth is dry. And um, you're probably not making as much urine right now. Your blood is being diverted away from these non-essential organs because we don't care if you're digesting the cheeseburger you ate for lunch. We're, di we're diverting that blood to the muscles so that we can deal with this emergency. So if we can run out of there if we need to. So that's one reason why somebody, if they're really uh, excited or something like that, or they're doing a lot of exercise, they may not be able to digest very well, right? All right, other things besides nerve impulses can also alter heart rate. Um, stimulant drugs, uh, then we call catecholamines, things like epinephrine, they're gonna increase heart rate, sometimes increase the contractility, maybe a little bit more stroke volume. Whereas acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that uh, basically mimics parasympathetic effects, reduces heart rate, okay. So when you think about dogs, if they get a hold of a stimulant drug, it's going to raise their heart rate. If they get a hold of a downer, it's going to bring them down as well. Uh, but we use this information in the veterinary clinic because when an animal is under anesthesia, do you think the heart rate's going to be depressed or increased? Depressed. depressed. It can be depressed. So we'll talk about some of these drugs that we use to reverse these changes. If the heart rate goes down, what do we call that? If it goes too low? Bradycardia. Bradycardia. Okay. Bradycardia, the heart rate's too low, and that can also sometimes cause hypotension. It can cause lower than normal blood pressure. And so there's several drugs they can have on hand, epinephrine, glycopyrrolate, atropine, that basically will increase the heart rate and they'll increase uh, vasoconstriction. So maybe we get a little bit more uh, higher blood pressure. So a lot of these drugs are what we call anticholinergics. They're against acetylcholine. Acetylcholine's wanting to drop our heart rate. This helps to bring us back up. Okay, so uh, yeah, what I was saying is that we, oftentimes some drugs will re uh, induce bradycardia and hypotension. And for this reason, we anticipate it. We're gonna monitor that animal. What are you gonna monitor during anesthesia? What kinds of things do you wanna know? Heart rate. Oxygen, yeah. The heart rate and the pulse should be the same thing, theoretically. Now that's interesting, is that where would you take a pulse on a dog? Is that what we push on the tongue? Well, you can get a pulse out of that. So a peripheral pulse is you're feeling a heartbeat away from the heart. So sometime, again, I'll bring in some stethoscopes, hopefully next time, and you can listen to your own heart and when it beats, we call that your apical pulse because it's the apex of your heart. And then you can palpate or feel some of these peripheral pulse points. And what you'll find is you'll hear a beat, there'll be a slight delay, and then you'll feel it down here, right? Because it takes a while to get down there. And in dogs and cats, typically you're gonna be feeling on the inside of the leg uh, for the femoral artery. And if you're doing that and you hear a heartbeat and you don't always feel a pulse, we call that a pulse deficit. And it indicates that the pressure may not be high enough to always be reaching the tissues. And, and that's a bad sign. So sometimes the number of pulses you feel 
and the number of heartbeats could be different, but that would be bad. So um, we do want to monitor things like um, under anesthesia, we want to monitor the heart rate, the respiration rate. Uh, we want to monitor blood oxygen, and we'll, we'll show some examples of monitoring equipment here in just a little bit. Okay, now we're going to shift on to blood vessels, and we already said there's arteries, there's veins, there's capillaries. Uh, which one carries blood back to the heart? Veins. veins. Okay, so veins carry blood back to the heart. We've got veins here on our right. Whoops. But just remember that when you're opening up your cat in a few weeks to look at the cardiovascular system, um, they may not be color-coded like this. <laughs> they may actually be. We, we do sometimes buy the double-injected cats where the arteries are injected with red latex and the veins are injected with blue. But what often happens is the injecting guy gets a little too <laughs> excited and then it just ruptures and then you just have blue or you know, red, yeah, different colors in there. And so we've got arteries bring blood from the heart, high pressure blood, capillaries where we have exchange of nutrients, and then veins that are carrying usually low pressure blood back to the heart. Okay. So which one do you think has the thickest wall? Arteries. Arteries. Arteries are under high pressure. And so here's a cross section of an artery. And arteries have three different layers, and veins do as well. So on the inside we have something called the tunica intima or tunica interna and it's made up of uh, epithelial tissue, squamous epithelial tissue. And the whole purpose on the inside of the blood vessel is you want a smooth, friction-free surface. Why do you want a smooth, friction-free surface? So nothing gets tripped up. If something gets tripped up, what could happen? Get a clot. If we have clot, if we have a rough lining to our blood vessel, it could uh, inadvertently cause a clot. And a clot in an unbroken blood vessel can sometimes be very dangerous, right? We call that a thrombus. Or if it travels and then gets lodged somewhere, what do we call that? An embolus. an embolus, which can cause an embolism. So we want a nice, smooth internal lining. Uh, the next layer is something called the tunica media, okay, and here. And the tunica media is made up of smooth muscle. And so that's involuntary muscle. What's the purpose of that smooth muscle? to maintain blood pressure. And the way that the arteries maintain blood pressure is through either constricting or dilating. If I look at the same artery, and this artery is dilated, and this is the hole. What do we call the hole through which fluid flows? The lumen. This is the lumen of a relaxed artery. And this is the same artery that's now constricted and it's given us a smaller lumen. Okay. How is that going to change the pressure as I go from here to here? Okay, I want you to think you're sitting out there, you're watering your lawn, you don't like cats, here comes a cat, you go, and you squeeze that hose, what happens? Is it comes out harder, so that's higher pressure. It may reduce the flow, don't get me wrong, it may reduce flow, which is how much is coming by there, but the pressure goes up, right? Okay, so pressure goes up as I constrict the opening. Again, think about having a nice loose rubber hose, water's coming out gradually, and you squeeze on it, the water's going to come out more forcefully. The pressure's going to go up. So when we have vasoconstriction, when this smooth muscle layer constricts, it's going to uh, increase the blood pressure. Okay? And this is what happens if you've been laying down all day, watching TV, and you stand up real suddenly, and you get that almost blackout. Okay? You would black out, except what happens is that your blood vessels constrict to save the day, and they force that blood into a smaller space, giving you higher pressure. Make sense? Okay, so constriction gives us a higher blood pressure. So arteries uh, have this smooth muscle that allows us to increase the blood pressure by constriction. And on the outside, we have something called the tunica externa, uh, which is made up of connective tissue, collagen fibers. Um, this is really important, especially in arteries, because of their high pressure. I want you to think about what a fire hose is made out of. What's on the outside of a fire hose? You never looked at a fire? It's canvas, right? It's canvas. Do you think canvas is waterproof? No. No. So it's rubber inside that hose, I'm sure. I've never cut one open, but I'm sure they are. Okay, so why do you think that canvas is there? 
to protect the rubber and keep the rubber from bursting, okay? I've never held a fire hose when it's been, you know, turned on, but I've watched TV. I see those guys and they're like, mm, you know, it looks like there's a lot of pressure in there. And what that outer fibrous layer, the, the outer canvas layer does is protect the inner hose from bursting. So it, it's a uh, containment. And the connective tissue here, the collagen fibers, is the same way. It's a hard case surrounding the artery that prevents it from overexpanding and rupturing. Okay. That being said, sometimes arteries do rupture. What do we call that? We see this in people more often than dogs. You burst a blood vessel. Aneurysm, right? Which can cause a stroke. Okay, all kinds of things. Um, all right, so we talked about arteries, high pressure blood coming away from the heart. Now onto arterioles. Arterioles are the link between arteries and capillaries. So they're smaller vessels, they have less layers, a little bit of smooth muscle, and of course the endothelial layer. And um, they can regulate their diameter as well. And they're what feeds a capillary bed. And so within a capillary bed, if these are the capillaries, there's something sometimes called a thoroughfare channel, which is a bypass. Like I don't want to go all the, down these little streets, so I'll just bypass everything. And so a lot of times your capillary beds are bypassed. You know, blood just goes through them. All the capillaries are closed because on the edge of each capillary, there's something called a sphincter. What is a sphincter? Yeah. It's a valve. It's a ring of smooth muscle here that opens up or closes. And so these are sphincters that can open up. When they open up, blood flows in the capillary bed. But when they're closed, blood is just diverted from arterial to venule, and it doesn't go through the capillary bed. And so periodically, these will open up through the process of vasomotion. Um, now, when you notice this, when you notice a capillary bed really opening up, is think about when somebody blushes. Okay. Normally right now, hopefully you don't have like red cheeks the whole time, right? We don't look like, you know, I don't know, Irish leprechauns or anything like that. Um, but when you are embarrassed, those precapillary sphincters open up, blood goes into the capillaries, and that's why you blush. So we can sometimes regulate how much blood moves through a capillary bed. Okay, now onto veins. Veins are going to have the same three layers that arteries do, but they're going to be thinner. Okay. Why do you think they're going to be thinner? Less pressure. Less pressure, right? We lost pressure in our capillary bed. Blood slowed down. It lost pressure. We still have a tunica externa. It's relatively thin. Uh, and we still have a tunica media, which is smooth muscle. It's relatively thin. And then we also have uh, the inside layer. That's the intima, sorry. Uh, that's made up of epithelial tissue. So epithelial tissue, smooth muscle, and a little bit of connective tissue. Um, two things are different about veins relative to arteries. Is one is that veins tend to be larger. Um, if I have, if this is an artery, and I have a vein running next to it, which I often will, it will be about this big. Okay. Why do you think it's so much bigger? So more blood, yeah. There's more blood headed back than there is going out. Is How does that work? No. <laughs> no. Oh, wow. uh, Same amount of blood's coming back. The only thing we lost is pressure. And so a blood vessel like this works well if you have high pressure. But if you have low pressure, it's hard for blood to get through that small of an opening. So the larger the opening we have, the less resistance we have to flow of blood because blood is flowing back at a crawl through veins. And for that reason, veins also have one-way valves that hopefully keep blood going the right direction. Okay. What's the driving force for moving blood through these veins? Muscle movement. Yeah, just body movement, muscle movement, muscle contraction. Here we're talking about skeletal muscles. As your body moves, it squeezes on the veins and that forces some blood back towards the heart. Okay. Sometimes these valves uh, malfunction and they don't work. So you see those people with varicose veins or the big blobby veins in their legs. Sometimes the valves break down and, and you actually get these sort of, um, I don't know, unattractive looking veins in the legs. All right, so here is what an artery and vein look like. General rule for lab, three structures always run together. Arteries, veins, and what's the third? Nerves. Nerves. There's usually an artery and a vein and a nerve that are going to follow each other. 
So this is an artery, and you can see it has this little tiny opening. It's pretty constricted in here, lots of smooth muscle. And then the vein is just over here. The opening is proportionally a lot larger. Okay, the wall is a lot thinner because it doesn't have to withstand that high pressure. Mm -hmm. So arteries tend to be circular. Veins tend to collapse when they don't have any pressure through and they tend to be more uh, oval shaped. Okay. All right, so let's go back to our capillary beds and I would talk something about something called filtration and reabsorption. We said capillaries were how many cell layers thick? One, one cell layer thick. So they're very delicate. Uh, they're also very porous, things leak out. Okay, so if this is blood and there's our red blood cells and the you know, green things are albumin and those little dots are electrolytes, uh, what leaks out? What do we call the fluid that leaks out? Yeah, initially it's interstitial fluid. And the interstitial fluid usually doesn't have cells in it because cells are pretty big to leak out. But it does have electrolytes and things like that. So what would happen if this interstitial fluid kept getting forced out and never sucked back up? We'd have edema. Okay, we'd have this tissue of fluid accumulation. It would be very unsightly. Um, and your pants wouldn't fit and everything like that. So eventually we need to put that back in the bloodstream. One method we talked about already was with which system? Lymphatic. lymphatic. Okay, the lymphatic system does help to return some of that back to the body. The other way is through something called reabsorption. So let's look at filtration first. Um, so filtration is the movement of that fluid from in the blood out into the interstitial spaces. The main force here, the, the reason it got here in the first place was the force coming from the contraction of the heart. So as the heart contracts, it makes some pretty great blood pressure. And even though it's reduced by the capillaries, it's still significant. And so fluid is forced out. And that's through something we call blood hydrostatic pressure, BHP. And that's just generated by the heart. BHP is caused by the contraction or systole of the heart. There's also a minor pressure that assists with this called interstitial fluid osmotic pressure. What was osmosis? The diffusion of water. From the diffusion of water across a membrane from high to low. Okay. What determines which way water is going to move? Solutes. Solutes and solutes suck, right? So there are some solutes already out here. They're interstitial solutes. And they're going to do a little bit of sucking this way too, but not much. They're just assisting. And so that's called IFOP, interstitial fluid osmotic pressure. I know it sounds like a waffle restaurant, but it's not. So these are two things that are promoting, that are trying to force fluid this way. We also have another force that's trying to force fluid back the other way, and that's called uh, blood colloid osmotic pressure. This right here. And it's the movement of fluids and solutes back into the bloodstream. And the main force that's promoting that is BCOP, blood colloid osmotic pressure. And that's caused by these little green guys right here, which I'm going to say are albumin. Okay, albumin is your most important osmotic blood plasma protein because albumin acts like a big solute that can't cross that blood vessel. And so Imagine that we're at the arterial end over here, and this is the venous end. And as fluid's forced out, what happens to the pressure in this blood vessel? It becomes less. It becomes less. Think about those garden hoses you have that have the little holes poked in them. And then you, you know, hook that up to your spigot, you turn it on, and you know, if you're close to the spigot, a lot of water comes out. But if you're further away from the spigot, only a little water comes out. So as we go across here, the blood hydrostatic pressure decreases. But, uh, and after that happens, our blood colloid osmotic pressure becomes more important. With no residual hydrostatic pressure, these proteins begin to suck the excess fluid that was in the interstitial spaces uh, back into the bloodstream. So this is called blood colloid osmotic pressure. And it's basically what allows some reabsorption of fluid from the interstitial spaces back in the bloodstream. Okay, what happens if you don't have those albumins? There's no 
there's no sucking. You have fluid accumulation, you have edema. Yeah. Okay, so net filtration pressure is just simply the difference between these two forces. In a couple, you know, four or five more chapters when we go into the urinary system, we'll have you do some calculations about net filtration pressure because that's what helps to drive the kidneys and make sure that the kidneys are able to filter uh, waste products out. Uh, everywhere else besides the kidneys, there's something called Starling's Law of the Capillaries and just basically says that in most places, the amount of fluid that is filtered out ends up being sucked up anyway. So we're all good, okay? Uh, any residual amount that's not sucked up by reabsorption is gonna be sucked up by our lymphatic system. The only exception is our kidneys. The kidneys have a lot more filtration and reabsorption going on. Okay. All right, vascular anatomy. I am not going to make you know all the blood vessels for this class. Okay. Sam can do that, so uh, <laughs> have fun with that. There's a, there's a lot of them and they're <laughs> difficult to know. Now, one thing, just a, a, a teaching hint, is look at what a lot of the blood vessels are named. A lot of them are named either for the bone that they cross or the region of the body. Uh, what is this one right here called? What is that? I can't. Brachial. Brachial. Okay, what does that mean? Arm. That's in the arm. Okay, we'll have brachial and then brachial cephalic, which is up front. And then we've got somewhere here, subclavian. What do you think subclavian means? Below the clavicle. Below the clavicle, which is fine if you're a cat. You've got clavicles, little bitty ones, right? Subclavian. We have a subclavian artery, subclavian vein. So if you know the arteries, you know the veins. And then you've got, you know, your aorta, your descending aorta, caudal aorta, and you branch off. And what are these two branches called? Femoral. What does this one say? External. Oh. External. Iliac. Iliac. Why do you think it's named iliac arteries? That's just a weird name. It's named for the ilium. Okay, iliac arteries. And the iliac artery will later become the femoral artery. Thing is, it's like one long street that gets renamed, right? <laughs> it's like Hawaii, driving in Hawaii, right? Like when the things, and you've got two streets, you've got two Farrington highways, but they don't meet up. Nobody tells you that, right? Okay. You're supposed to know. All right, so the things that you do need to know, the vessels you need to know for my class are the ones that we typically go to for vena puncture. And why would we do vena puncture? The blood draw, okay. We need to do a lab test or something like that. We want to do an ELISA. Where do we go to get blood? Um, that's a cat. Um, let's go to a dog first, okay. Dogs, there's probably two places you're gonna go. The cephalic vein, which is right up here on the arm, and then the jugular vein. Um, now, I like to go to the cephalic vein. It's easier for me. My dog has a big hairy neck and it's just like, you can't find it in there. But if you're in a clinic and that dog, let's say, is going to be going under anesthesia tomorrow, you're going to go for the jugular. Does anybody know why? So you, don't blow the vein. you don't want to blow these veins down here. When you do vena puncture, sometimes you will, what we call, temporarily you know, blow the veins where they won't be able to be used for a few days. Uh, and here is where we're going to be administering IV fluids. And so, you know, if the dog's just coming in for a visit, you will need some blood for a heartworm test, fine. You use the cephalic vein. But if the dog's coming in for some testing and then, you know, a dental cleaning, you want to get your blood from up here, okay? Uh, and you can also go to the saphenous vein, lateral saphenous vein. Um, on cats, again, they have a cephalic vein, a jugular vein, a femoral vein. Um, I'm not the person to talk to with blood draws on cats. Again, talk to Sam. What's the best way? You're going to have to wrap that cat. Horses and cows are awesome because, um, Generally, you're trying to hit little bitty blood vessels on a tiny dog. On a horse, you're talking about a blood vessel that can be like that wide. <laughs> and so as long as you can find the jugular vein a horse, man, you can just keep taking all that you want and it's a lot easier to hit. Uh, same with a coccygeal vein and, and a cow. Um, they're fairly easy to hit. Um, again, you're not going to be doing a whole lot of work with cows here on Oahu, uh, mainly with cats and dogs. So just remember the jugular and the cephalic uh, uh, bracket. <laughs> The jugular and the cephalic. Those are your two veins that you want to hit. Okay, important thing about veins is a lot of the blood is stored in veins. We have a lot of veins in the skin and we have a lot of blood being stored as well in the abdominal organs, uh, in the liver and in the spleen. Particularly in horses and dogs, the spleen can store a lot of blood. 
and it's kind of just stored there until it's needed. You know, you think about a time when the animal's all of a sudden going to be running a lot, and we need to force a lot of that into circulation. Uh, or if it has blood loss, the spleen can force that extra blood into circulation to help uh, buffer that. So in general, on any one moment, 60% of the blood in the body is actually hanging out in veins. That's where you're going to find the blood. Okay, there's a very small volume in arteries and, and, and capillaries. Okay, blood pressure. Um, blood pressure, you've heard of, we said there's systolic pressure, and where does that come from? <coughs> yeah, when the heart's contracting, that gives us our systolic pressure. Okay, when systole happens, we have systolic pressure. And that, is that a high pressure or a low pressure? High pressure. So at that point, we might be at 120 millimeters of mercury, okay. which is just a measurement of pressure. That's the high. And then when the heart relaxes, we might go down to 80 millimeters of mercury. That's the low. Okay, why don't we drop all the way to zero when the heart's relaxing? Yeah, we'd pass out. So what's keeping us from passing out? What's keeping some residual pressure in those vessels? Elasticity of vessels, <laughs> particularly the aorta. When that systolic burst came, when we had that systole contraction, that blood stretched the walls of the aorta, and then as, as the ventricles relax, the aorta reflexively contracts, so it keeps a little bit of pressure up. So 120 over 80, that would be a good systolic and diastolic pressure. Now, the reason we measure pressure, and the reason we measure heart rate, the thing we're really trying to get at is tissue perfusion. That's what we're really trying to find out. Is blood getting to the tissues where it needs to go? And so knowing the pressure is a good way to figure out if the answer is yes or no. And we want to figure out and make sure all the tissues are perfused with blood, because if they're not, those tissues can die. And um, this is particularly important during what? When do you really want to know if organs are being supplied with blood? Surgery. During surgery, during anesthesia, because that animal can't respond. Okay, it's hard to assess their reflexes because they're diminished, dampened, or absent. And so we need to have an idea of, of what perfusion is, and we'll talk about how to do that. So. Um, We'll measure systolic and diastolic pressure. A good vital signs monitor will use these two to calculate something called mean arterial pressure. <coughs> this is the one that's probably as closest to <coughs> saying how well is the perfusion in the body because we can have a high systolic pressure and then a very low diastolic and we may still have inadequate perfusion. Or if we just have low of both, that's gonna be inadequate perfusion. So it's a calculation that you have down there to figure out the mean arterial pressure, which is just figuring out on average, what's the average pressure in these blood vessels? So ideally, mean arterial pressure should be above 80 millimeters of mercury. If it's below that, it might indicate that we have some problems with tissue perfusion. And again, animals under anesthesia may not know that, that you had a problem until that animal wakes up or doesn't. Um, and this actually started, you know, a lot of what's rolled down in the veterinary world started in the human world. They would have people go into anesthesia and they come back out and they, were, they just weren't right. They lost some brain cells. And so anesthesiologists began figuring to protect their butts, we need to start monitoring more. We monitor, you know, they're already doing blood pressure. And then they also went to look at oxygen saturation, okay, which is using something called a pulse ox, uh, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Anyway, backing up, big picture is the body has different ways to maintain blood pressure. If our blood pressure is too low, one thing that the body can do is increase the heart rate. Okay. Beating faster can help increase pressure. We can also adjust our stroke volume. When the heart beats more forcefully, the stroke volume goes up. Have you ever felt your heart beat more forcefully? Yes. Like those nights when you're sitting there and you've been studying all night and then like drank two pots of coffee, had two Red Bulls, and you're sitting in bed and your heart's like, don't take it, don't take it, you know. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Um, <laughs> And you're like, I'm gonna die now. Like, you know, I remember thinking that I was like 20 years old in college. I'm like, I'm going to die in my bed. Um, so the heart can beat sometimes more forcefully. The other thing that we can alter is something called systemic vascular resistance. <coughs> what does that mean? 
we're talking about the systemic circuit, what did vascular mean? Vessels. Vessels, okay, and resistance has to do with the expansion uh, or contraction. So if your blood pressure is low, if it's starting to drop, one thing your brain could do is send a signal to your blood vessels and tell them to constrict. What's that going to do to pressure? pressure? Increase it. It might reduce the flow, but it's going to increase the pressure. And a lot of times pressure is, is what guarantees perfusion. So that's one way to alter it. <coughs> and the last way is to adjust the blood volume. If you have an animal that's lost blood, you think that's going to have a normal blood pressure, high blood pressure, or a low blood pressure? Yeah. Low blood pressure, okay. So blood volume, if blood volume goes down, pressure goes down. On the other hand, if volume goes up, pressure goes up. How can you use this to your advantage? If you have an animal that comes in, he's in shock, he's lost some blood. Well, you can get a transfusion if you can find a dog to do that. In the meantime, while you're looking for a dog to transfuse from, what else could you do? Fluids. Just fill them up full of IV fluids, right? And so when you have your classes with your veterinarians and technicians, they'll talk about what kinds of fluids, what's the rate, but increasing blood volume is a way to uh, increase blood pressure. Um, where does your blood volume come from? Where does the fluid that's in your blood come from? Water. Water. Okay, where does the water come from? You drink it. You drink it. So, Think about what you're drinking right now. People are much better hydrated in college than I was. Um, we've got these big jugs right here, and so, Kendra, is that about a, is that a liter jug? I don't know. It's on the side right by your Okay, it looks, looks like about a liter to me, and so let's say it's a liter. If your average blood volume is five liters, and you drink this, all of it within probably 15 minutes gets absorbed into your blood. So all of a sudden your blood's gone from five liters to six liters. What would this do to pressure? Increase, Increase it, right? Okay, increase. Fortunately, your kidneys are pulling it out if, if there's excess just as quickly as you're putting it in. But taking that fluid in, if you took it in IV, could temporarily increase your blood pressure because it's increased volume. So increased volume of blood or fluids can temporarily increase blood pressure. Oh, bloop, go back. All right, the one thing that I just popped off is we talk about diseases of the heart. Um, dogs don't get so old that we get a whole lot of heart disease, except I want to talk about heartworm. Okay, every vet's office you've probably went to has like this jar, right? The jar in there and it's got the heart and the heartworms. Uh, trying to educate clients and show them you know, how bad heartworm infections can be. Um, has anyone ever had a heartworm positive dog? Oh, from Alabama? Why am I not surprised? <laughs> oh, okay. Did you not? Okay. These are like farm dogs that, you know. No, it's farm dogs are different. I have a friend of mine, she's uh, from Kentucky, and her farm dogs, they, you know, they were a lot of fun, but she's like, and then one time a cat came up and had kittens, and the next morning the farm dogs are playing with the kitten heads that they had just, oh. I guess, eaten the rest, different breed, farmer's dogs. Um, so heartworm is caused by a worm, but what was the vector for this worm? How did it get in the bun? Mosquitoes. Okay, so mosquitoes, we have mosquitoes in Hawaii? Yeah, we have a lot of mosquitoes. And so we need heartworm prevention all year round because these mosquitoes can spread um, the microfilaria, these little bitty worms, into the bloodstream. And when you take Sam's class, she'll probably try to find you some heartworm positive blood. You'll pull out the microfilaria and see them sort of swimming around in there. And as they find the heart and the blood vessels around the heart, and the pulmonary arteries and I think pulmonary veins, they grow larger and larger and larger. They cause inflammation and they can cause you know, um, reduced um, cardiac output, they can cause sudden death, and one of the problems is once we detect them, um, is getting rid of them. Because it's a delicate business. If you kill all the worms off at once, uh, they could clog uh, an essential blood vessel somewhere and cause immediate death. And so um, 
after we've detected a dog with a positive case of it, they'll probably do an x-ray, see if they can see uh, are the, you know, the atria distended, are the blood vessels distended, um, and then they're going to treat it with something that will kill those worms off. Anybody know what that is? Arsenic. Yeah, it's basically arsenic, okay? It's very difficult, it's very expensive. That animal has to stay uh, very quiet for uh, several weeks while those worms die off. Uh, one of the things they think that causes so much of the uh, the pathology is actually um, a bacteria that's inside the worms called Wolbachia. And they think that it's the combination of the worms and the bacteria as the worms die off that can cause a lot of the problems. So sometimes they'll even treat that with doxycycline, uh, you know, while they're trying to treat it with a miticide. So the best thing you can do is prevention, right? Is just, you know, take your heartworm preventative uh, once a month and then get tested. Um. Several thousand dollars in here. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of people hear that, and in fact, the drug that they used to cure it was in short supply for quite a lot while. And I, some of the veterinarians now just try on little, you know, putting them on heartworm prevention, and, and some of them will um, put them on doxycycline and see if their tests eventually show up negative. But uh, yeah, you don't want a heartworm positive dog. You just want to, okay, the treatment is pretty inexpensive, yeah. So this is 